In a world which is connected in every possible way, we take on the challenge for the next step forward. Say hello to a better mobility future. A mobility future for people, not cars. For us, to me, has been a window into the world, and um, that's amazing because we see people who are struggling with similar things, but we also see solutions. We also see promise. We see hope, and it's real. We believe in innovation, knowledge, investment. The aim is to support decision makers, actors, planners, experts in uh, the area of urban planning in how to change this into integrated planning. For the organization, it's taking us to a place that we honestly never imagined we would be in terms of having the legitimacy, the credibility, the support um, to roll out a program you know, with the credibility. To me, that is something that you can't just get in your bank account. We support urban leaders all around the world with innovative solutions on the ground, providing state-of-the-art know-how and mobilizing investments to achieve a more sustainable urban mobility future. The initiative is an extraordinary program all around the world, helping cities become more livable and in a sustainable way, it's helping cycling, it's helping walking, it's helping compact urban development, and it's also helping innovation. We have the future in mind. Together we transform urban mobility. For the better of the world, for the better of all. Welcome back to Tumi TV. We already looked at the impact of COVID-19 in the mobility sector in Asia, Africa and Europe. Before our short break, we just opened the discussion on how a green recovery can look like. We have some more guests who have already thought about this question. Let's switch directly to the next guest. Christian Haas is CEO at PTV Group. As CEO, he initiated and advanced the company's transformation from a traditional software supplier to a software as a service company. We now welcome Mr. Haas. PTV provides complex traffic simulations to planning departments worldwide. Did you ever simulate a situation like now? Well, in fact, we have customers who use our software tools to prepare in advance for national catastrophes with infrastructure and mobility action plans. Special situations, such as the Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand, are also used as an opportunity to take a closer look at the existing resilience to disasters in many other cities around the world. What role do data and simulations play in assessing the impact of a crisis like this? We see a lot of pop-up bike lanes. Can your software be used to plan these measures? Well, data analysis and simulation can show the impact on the complete mobility ecosystem. You can use them to evaluate and visualize new scenarios such as new bike lanes, for example. Software can be the base for the decision-making how temporary solutions can be implemented as well as how they can be transferred into a permanent new feature for our cities. The effects of COVID-19 could be a crossroad. Either cities will pl be planned car-centered or we use the opportunity now and use the street space for people. Which scenario do you think is more likely? Well, that is not easy to foresee. What we learn is how good things can be if you reallocate space for different kinds of mobility. That includes, for example, pedestrians as well as bikes. Cities cannot be obtained by cars only. Less cars means less pollution, and less pollution means less virus spreading due to less condensed air. In my opinion, cities should move towards a people-friendly and sustainable environment for its citizens. What is needed for a green recovery and how can PTV support it? Well, now is the time to rethink, rewind and re-evaluate what's currently happening and how we want to move forward. PTV's technology for the optimization of transportation and mobility systems can support cities and public authorities within the current decision-making processes. And I really hope the experience of less congested and cleaner cities will lead to a real shift in our daily mobility behavior. It is impressive to hear which scenarios can be modeled with the right software and how important data is to have a precise model. Cities have thus an option to try out new infrastructure before they even build it. 
that should give everybody the possibility to have a look at how sustainable mobility could look like in their city. Hello and welcome. My name is Angela Franke. I'm working at the Dresden University of Technology as the Chair of Traffic and Transportation Psychology and I'm happy to give you a few details on our online survey on mobility behavior and its change due to coronavirus. Um, I've prepared a few slides for you. And just want to start with a short background why we are actually into this uh, survey. So the choice of the transport mode is like a highly habituated behavior and it's going to be reconsidered during the outbreak of the coronavirus. So this is actually an opportunity to investigate such transition processes. So in our mind, we had the question, is due to this sudden and strong interventions, is there any change in behavior? And is this something which is actual or is it even some long lasting behavior change? In this time, did people change their mo uh, modes of transportation and what means of transportation are in particular high demand during this uh, process. We uh, came up very quickly. We already started our survey like one week after all the pandemic was announced at the 20th of March. And we've set it up in several questions. I'm giving you today uh, some details of the German uh, survey. More than 5,000 people participated. It's 50% male and female, and also the age distribution is quite uh, nicely spread all over the age groups, so we can have uh, more details on these groups. Um, we also ask uh, at which stage of lockdown these people were, and we can see that, like, more or less 100% actually had some problems uh, due to the corona in terms of school or university closures or voluntary self-isolation or some sort of curfew. So more or less 95% uh, percent of the respondents are affected by any form of restriction. If you are now checking for the change of the mobility behavior during this corona outbreak, we can see that uh, 59% changed their transportation use since the outbreak, and we have the strongest effects in public transportation use and cycling and in walking, with the public transportation really having a, a decrease and also long distance trains, of course, but uh, with cycling and walking, these active mobility modes being the ones who had the highest increase. More or less, everyone also reported uh, like that they are avoiding uh, several trips like leisure trips mostly, and uh, prefer to stay at home or uh, change the mode. This change is also due to the like, uh, staying at home to take care for your kids, or because you can uh, change it towards uh, teleworking or some other home office activities. Uh, if we continue and have a deeper look in terms of the public transportation. We can see, uh, we already asked the people if they would keep this change behavior and even after the corona crisis would uh, keep off uh, public transportation. And we could see that more or less 26%, 23% agreed on this to avoid public transportation, but the majority uh, disagree and they would uh, use the transportation afterwards. But of course, public transportation needs investments, also needs uh, um, more than just wearing the mask now, but also in terms of marketing or showing the positive sides of public transportation. So our next steps now for the survey, we will have a follow-up survey. So this more or less 5,000 people uh, told us uh, also that we could ask them again. So after the pandemic, we want to set up another questionnaire, and then we can compare the mobility behavior report during and after pandemic and see if there are any lasting effects, which kind of people uh, continued with the mobility behavior or what it actually needed that th such new mobility behavior uh, got established. If you have any further questions, I'm happy to answer. Here are my contact details, and 
thanks for your um, attention. For our next guest, I had the chance to do an interview here at the GIZ headquarter. Please let me now welcome Vera Scholz. Mrs. Scholz is the Director for Climate Change, Environment and Infrastructure at the GIZ. Mrs. Scholz, Frankfurt is just a stone throw away. And uh, in Frankfurt, there's one of the biggest airports in Europe. So normally or usually um, the sky is full of airplanes. Um, but now, um, due to the corona pandemic, air traffic dropped by 95% here in Frankfurt. We can see the same on the roads. There are just a few cars, no traffic jam. <laughs> less traffic means less carbon emissions. Um, so these are just two examples how Corona affects worldwide emissions. How do you assess the impact of COVID-19 on the international climate effect? You're completely right. I live uh, in the city of Frankfurt and usually we would hear and see some airplanes in the sky, but the sky is empty. So that also means that there is a big shock because of COVID-19 uh, for the transport sector and our economies as a whole. On the other hand, we know that there is a drop of emissions about 8% uh, due to the pandemic and the reduction um, of the CO2 emissions. And the UN um, estimates that these 8% is precisely what we need per year um, to reach the 1.5 target we have laid down in the Paris Agreement. So um, that is one of the big, big impacts of the pandemic we are facing now. Prior to Corona, topics like um, climate and environment have been really present. Fridays for Future is still protesting worldwide, um, just online now, but still with a global crowd of supporters. People still show interest to rescue our planet, and there are also some politicians that have it on their agenda. So what do you think needs to be done politically to turn the pandemic into a climate opportunity? Well, I mean, what we see now that um, for the ad hoc measures we see currently, there is a lot of um, funds which are now earmarked to fight the pandemic. And I think it is also very right, also when we think about many countries um, uh, where the health systems is not so strong as, for example, here in Germany. So there's a lot of funds now going to, uh, to fight the, the health crisis, if you want. Um, but there's also a recovery phase because, I mean, we have seen so many um, companies have to, uh, had to lock down uh, their, their uh, activities. Um, and then we have to um, get to a recovery phase. And we also know that many governments and the EU um, uh, have earmarked funds for this uh, recovery phase. Now, from uh, the climate perspective, it would be very good if we could use all these funds also for to build a better future and a climate neutral future and invest uh, these funds, um, especially in uh, climate friendly technologies. So um, to build back better or to have a green recovery, because some people from the climate community fear that these funds and these big, um, big uh, budgets, which are earmarked to fight uh, the pandemic or to um, to invest into the recovery phase, is going to be invested into um, fossil fossil industries. So, what would you say? What are the key ingredients of a successful green recovery program? I mean, what we see currently is we, are, we have started um, to use so many digital, um, for example, technologies, so we all work from home. Um, we um, sometimes don't use uh, the, the cars and we, we bike. Um, some people have started to buy more locally because international supply chains are um, disrupted. So I think we have uh, everybody, not only the people working in the climate community, but everybody has um, now certain ideas what can be done. 
And I think that could be ingredients that we um, even think over whether we really have to fly for our holidays to Asia or to uh, Latin America, or we also can spend some time in our own countries. That doesn't mean that I don't want to promote tourism in these countries, that's also important. But if we could reduce a little bit, it would be very nice. Um, I also think that um, we especially in the transport sector. It is very important to invest funds, um, also coming from the, the recovery funds, for example, to invest them into e-mobility, yeah, in public transport systems. Um, we also have to think about uh, what we started with Tumi uh, many years ago, already um, uh, the, the women, uh, uh, mobilized women, yeah, so that we also think in this crisis about how to protect uh, women in the transport sector and how to involve them in the transport sector. I think these are very um, important ingredients we can, we must have. You have co-launched the Initiative Act, which stands for Action Toward Climate-Friendly Transport Initiative. It is one of the biggest initiatives in this field, supported by 100 entities. How does ACT as a global corporation react to this pandemic? First of all, uh, GIZ is very happy to be part of the ACT initiative and it's an initiative which was uh, created after the UN Climate Summit last year in 2019. And what is so um, striking about the initiative is it is an international initiative and I do think that it is very important to have international cooperation in this situation, not only because we want to go about uh, climate uh, friendly transport sector, but also nowadays we would uh, at the same time like to uh, fight the pandemic. So we have one component in the ACT initiative, the component number one, which deals with uh, policy frameworks and which, which also nowadays looks um, at how to find, uh, fight the pandemic um, in, the, in the transport sector, what can be done in the transport sector um, to overcome the pandemic. Yeah? So that is uh, uh, our component number one. And component number two and three deal with uh, shifts uh, towards um, zero emission and climate friendly vehicles and cars. Yeah, also a very important component. And the fourth one deals with dialogue with the private sector, because I do believe that the private sector is very crucial and important for us to go about a shift uh, uh, in the transport sector and the transition in the transport sector. But it also plays a very important uh, role uh, to fight the pandemic. So I believe that ACT is really a very, very powerful instrument um, in the future uh, to build a bit of better future uh, in the transport sector and go about a transformation. Thank you, Mrs. Scholz. Before we hear our next guest, let's have a look at how the New York Times Square looks like when there is no traffic jam. I mean, it really is amazing. You almost never see this little traffic in the middle of the day on 7th Avenue. When we were here a year or so ago, we saw sidewalks just jam-packed with people, shoulder to shoulder, being forced out into the street because there was no space on the sidewalk. There were real problems for handicapped people, people with strollers. I mean, it was a real dense crush of people. Even long before Corona came around, people were talking about the need for creating more pedestrian space. But now that need has become much more urgent than ever. And there's a lot of streets around here where sidewalks can be widened or they can be closed to through traffic. Look at this, it goes to show you the latent demand for cycling. I mean, people, you never see this many cyclists here under normal conditions. Even that there are so few cars and so few pedestrians, there are way more cyclists than normal. And I think it goes to show just the latent demand for cycling if streets were safer. Because now without so much traffic, it's a lot safer and feels a lot less threatening. And we even saw some kids biking around Times Square, which is something you almost never see. The streets are so unthreatening that people actually can look around and take in the neighborhood and don't just have to be focused on the threats around them. We need to make our streets safe for cycling because it's healthy, 
and it's spatially efficient way to get around and there's going to be a lot of people avoiding the subway and if those people all start driving this city's going to have real problems this crisis with corona is not going to last forever and the crowds are going to come back and if we don't start planning now we're going to go back to the same overcrowded congested public spaces that we had before. This is an opportunity for us to plan and take action to make sure New York comes back better and stronger than ever. Our next expert is Christian Hochfeld, Executive Director of the German think tank Agora Verkehrswende, with extensive regional experience in the mobility sector in China. Agora Verkehrswende and TUMI have a long history of developing approaches and innovative ideas to push for a sustainable, sustainable mobility transition. Today, Mr. Hochfeld shares with us his thoughts on how economic stimuli can fight against COVID-19 and climate crisis at the same time. Agora Verkehrswende is the most well-known think tank on mobility questions in Germany. You have been lobbying for a Verkehrswende, a mobility transition, for many years. Do you think we saw peak transport emissions in December 2019? If it comes to Germany, I'm quite optimistic that we saw the peak of the greenhouse gas emissions from transport um, by the end of the last year. Over the last 25 years, we were not be able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from transport in absolute terms, but we were able to unbundle the transport emissions from the transport growth. But still, if I look at the rest of the world, there's a strong linkage still between economic growth, the growth of the transport volumes, and also the growth of the transport emissions. So I think globally there's still a lot to do to really you know, see the decrease of the transport emissions in absolute terms. As concerns mobility, this crisis has the potential to have a huge impact on people's mobility behavior. A world after Corona could see less flying, more working from home, and also an increase in local consumption. In a second scenario, we could see that people refer to their private car for social distancing more, where people shop online mostly, and flying becomes cheap because of low oil prices. Which scenario do you think is more likely to happen? From my perspective, honestly speaking, and this is, uh, most Germans are a, lit or a little bit more critic and uh, pessimistic. So I really see a great danger that we now have a huge problem um, with the image, the reputation um, of public transport. Because at the moment, what we see in Germany is that the public transport is the so-called biggest loser of the COVID-19 crisis. The ridership uh, is reduced by about 90 percent. And uh, that means we now have to, you know, make the public transport attractive for the people again. And this will be a huge effort. It will really demand all our, let's say, um, focus um, to really bring the people back in the public transport and to make the public transport attractive and safe again because public transport is really the backbone of the transformation of the transport sector. So this is, I think, the biggest task, but we will be able to do this and uh, I still see a silver lining, I would call it a green lining for public transport, but it depends on how we manage this. I think before this crisis uh, came over us, um, we were very skeptical um, about that people may change their mobility behavior, um, may use different transport pattern. But we definitely see that this is possible. On the one hand, for business trips, which make up 20% of all the trips uh, in Germany and also 20% of the greenhouse gas emission from transport, from passenger transport, but also with regard to your personal mobility. And in this regard, I think we can learn from this crisis in a way that we, in the past, we invested 
hundreds of billions of uh, euro in uh, physical infrastructure, concrete. We invested hundreds of billions in new technologies, but we did no investment in people adopting those technologies, adopting new services in transport, which makes them, you know, really also um, makes, it, makes it possible for them to travel in an environmental sound way. And I think if we focus on this, put more investment also in people, not only in infrastructure and technologies, this will help us also to remain some of the, and to keep some of the um, behavior changes and to really reduce emissions also by behavioral change. We need to reach a low carbon future. What do you think governments need to do now to support the mobility transition? As Agora, we uh, differentiate between three phases now um, to fight the corona crisis. At first, we have the, release, the relief phase. Uh, in this phase, I think it's very important for governments around the world to stabilize public transport and the financing of public transport. Secondly, we are talking about the recovery um, phase, where we need really a stimulus package um, for the, the transport world. And that means from our perspective, also investments in attractive public transport increase the quality of public transport, increase the digitization of public transport and combine it with uh, new mobility services for seamless transportation from door to door. That needs a huge investment and we also need investment for the energy transition in transport. So mainly if it comes to road transport for passenger and uh, freight to increase the electrification of public transport but also private cars and uh, freight vehicles in combination with an increase of renewable energies and renewable electricities that can be done in, in the investment package and we see the stimulus package as a chance to support uh, sustainable transport and the greenhouse gas emission reduction, the uh, transformation of transport. In the third phase, which we could call the reform phase, this will decide about how successful will the investments in the stimulus packages be. We still need a clear price on CO2. That is something we have to close, uh, very much focus on. But there also, we also need some more fiscal reforms um, to you know, lower the prices um, for more sustainable transport and um, increase and or internalize the external costs of privately owned vehicles. Um, only if we do this reform in a good way, also the stimulus package will be successful economically, but also from a climate perspective. Thank you, Mr. Hochfeld. It is encouraging to hear that we should use the money we spend to restart the economy only for future-proof industries, which also help us to curb climate change. Your proposed 15 billion euros for the German transport sector are well invested. I am also sure that the European Green Deal will have impact on the European Development Corporation. My main impression is one of huge appreciation for the logistics sector. They have been very responsive and very creative in making sure that we receive the goods and services that we need in the midst of this crisis. And the crisis has really shown our vulnerability and our connectedness um, also for goods. And I think now more than ever, we can see that freight transport doesn't exist on itself in itself. It is really the result of a request for someone um, requesting a service or a good being delivered to them. And I think this crisis has really exposed the importance of this sector within the discussion. I would like to say, don't be afraid to start with freight. So we have got to take this topic head on and capture the benefits that are there in this sector. So currently green freight is not 
a main point of discussion um, and is too absent from the thinking, I believe, in, in the discussion also in the recovery um, of the sector. And we have to change that, really given its great potential for benefits. So, for example, if you look at the topic of zero emission trucks or trucks specifically, um, trucks at the moment amount for only 2% of the vehicles on the road, but in the EU are responsible for 22% of road transport emissions. And this trend is only going to rise. So taking action on the topic of zero emission trucks is really very efficient and cost effective. I believe what is needed within this sector is an in-depth debate about the market for zero emission freight vehicles specifically. So the market is not where it should be or what it, where it could be um, to reach our climate goals. And companies state that the lack of zero emission freight vehicles available on the market is the main bottleneck at the moment for them to reach their transport decarbonization goals. And that's saying something. And sometimes the argument is made that there's no real demand for these types of vehicles. And I think we've shown that there is a large demand for these vehicles. So not only this statement from um, companies saying it's a main bottleneck, but also the TDA call for zero emission freight vehicles is collecting the demand and working together with EV100 um, and their members, we have collected over 260,000 vehicles in demand, and that's just a start. So because of the lack in supply of these vehicles, companies are being very creative and have actually started, for example, almost producing their own. So as you can see, um, Amazon late last year announced that they were working together with a small startup, Rivian, to produce 100,000 electric vans. Um, DHL has been producing their own street scooter, which is a zero emission van um, because there was no available vehicle for them on the market. And you also see that companies sometimes uh, refurbish old kind of or, or diesel vehicles into electric vehicles because the market is not um, offering these electric vehicles for them. So within the ACT initiative, the Action Towards Climate Friendly Transport Initiative, um, there is a component three group, the Action Group Zero Emission Freight Vehicles, that is very active and is co-chaired by TDA, CalStart Drive to Zero and EV100. And we are really trying to push this market forward. So we are organizing a series of events. Um, the first one actually later this week on the 27th is the kickoff within the Moving On Summit. And this is a series of dialogues to really foster the discussion between the supply side and the demand side and what is needed to together um, bridge that gap, bridge the gap between the demand and the supply and reach the climate goals. The results from this whole series will be conveyed to high level decision makers, eventually to COP26. We really aim to galvanize these commi commitments and skill up to action. Thank you. I'm really worried about... I'm really worried about public transit. TransLink is losing $75 million every month. Ridership is down 83%. Revenue from parking fees and gas taxes have taken a hit. And bus fares are not being collected since the decision to only allow rear door boardings. These revenue streams typically make up over half of TransLink's operating budget. Now, they're barely a trickle. Nice try. As a result, TransLink is making huge cuts to service. SkyTrain capacity is being reduced 15 to 40% with similar reductions planned for the West Coast Express and the C-Bus. On top of that, 18 bus routes have been suspended and another 47 bus routes will follow by mid-May. Our transit system is effectively being dismantled. Now, of course, most industries have taken a huge hit due to this pandemic. I mean, almost everyone has been looking for help in some way. So what makes public transit so special? Well, it's because of what will happen after this pandemic. You see, I think as we all get over COVID-19, most industries and businesses will eventually recover. But I'm not sure transit will. 
I think transit will be fun. Take, for example, the airline industry. After the pandemic, it's not like we'll stop flying, right? I mean, what are the alternatives? Long social distance walking to Oshiega? A cargo ship? No thanks. People will fly again because there really aren't any alternatives that match the convenience and speed of an airplane. Another example, restaurants. Sure, people aren't paying for $15 cocktails and truffle pasta right this moment, but we can only chew through our attempts at homemade sourdough bread for so long. People will eat out again. But public transit is a different story. When we come out of this pandemic, many will have a very viable alternative to taking transit. Driving. 2003. It was a different year with a different crappy US president and a different epidemic caused by bats. SARS. And at the epicenter of the outbreak in China, commuters purchased cars in record numbers to avoid the risk of catching the disease on public transit. At the same time, transit use plummeted and struggled to recover even as SARS cases dropped to zero. Today, the public bus system in Beijing still has fewer riders than before the SARS epidemic. Now, this story appears to be repeating itself. As cities in China recover from COVID-19, traffic congestion on highways has actually rebounded to levels higher than the previous year, while the share of transit users has dropped from 40% to just 24% of the population. I think a similar story is about to unfold in North America, but with much harsher consequences. Even before the pandemic, public transit systems here were facing challenges, and driving was the norm for most cities. For struggling transit systems, the pandemic will be more than a major setback. It could be a death sentence. Now, of course, switching to driving might make sense to a lot of people right now. Driving does limit your risk of being exposed to the coronavirus, and it happens to be a pretty convenient way of getting around. But as more and more people drive, some major problems come up. Gah, I feel like I say these points a lot, so I'll keep it brief. More cars and our limited road space creates more congestion, more pollution, and more collisions. But something I think we don't talk about enough is that driving is prohibitively expensive for a lot of people, and areas where most people drive tend to be places that are so spread out that cheaper options like walking or cycling are pretty much impossible. So more people driving isn't just a congestion, a pollution, or a collision issue, it's an equity issue. If you can't drive, you can't hold down a job as easily, access a service, or make friends even. You simply have less opportunity. Transit today exists as a public intervention to this problem. Instead of crowding our roads with one person per box, we group lots of people inside one box on the road, or in a fancy electric box in the sky, or this floating box on the Burrard Inlet. That reduces congestion, collisions, and pollution, and makes it much cheaper for someone that can't afford a box for themselves and pay $493 a month to ICBC to use that box. I probably didn't have to say box so much. But transit has a key challenge in North America. In most places, it is just so compellingly convenient to drive. It takes a lot of work and a frickin' fantastic transit system to convince someone who can afford to drive to take public transit. And here in Metro Vancouver, we've put in that work. Back in 1991, our regional government published a long-term transportation plan called Transport 2021. Back then, just 9% of people were taking public transit, while 83% of people were driving. And the number of drivers was growing each year. Transport 2021 was a plan to deliberately reverse this trend. In the following decades, our government made huge investments to improve our transit system and gradually shifted people from driving cars to taking buses, skytrains, and sea buses. And it worked. Today, 20% of people take public transit in Metro Vancouver, while 65% of people drive. That is a huge accomplishment. We've convinced a lot of people who could very well afford to drive to take public transit. And in doing so, we've blown past the original goal set out in Transport 2021. That is, until now. Because right now, the very idea of public transit is at odds with the pandemic for the foreseeable future. People are understandably scared of taking it, and those who can afford to may drive. And those who can't, well, they will face a transit system that is making cut after cut to service, making this transit crisis more and more permanent. You know, I hope I'm wrong about this. Because otherwise, here's what we have to look forward to as we flatten the curve. More congestion, accidents, and pollution on the roads. A less equitable society. And a transit system that's a skeleton of its former self. That's why I'm worried. Transit doesn't just need a bailout. It needs life support. I don't even know if this is the key or not. 
Didn't I do the best we could? I can't hit. I can't, bro. I can't. I'm trying to go up and hit it, but I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't hit it, bro. <laughs> Safe transit. This video from UTLE came with a very strong message that we need to deal with the future of public transport. UT will join us later in about one and a half hours in our uh, live Q and A session. I'm now handing over to Mohamed Metzgani, who is actually dealing with this question of the future of public transport. He is not only a fellow board member at the Slocat Partnership, but also uh, Secretary General of, the U of UITP, the International Association of Public Transport. Over to Mohamed. The pandemic has put four billion people in lockdown, with drastic impact on the mobility and in particular of public transport. In some cities, the loss in ridership has reached 95%, with important, of course, impact and reduction on fare box revenues, in addition to the cost to disinfect and implement physical distancing in vehicles and stations. The supply industry has suffered too, with the, some factories that had to stop production and a decrease in turnover for many companies. But public transport has continued operating during the lockdown, ensuring a service continuity which is needed and precious for the healthcare personnel, for the patients and for other category of the workforce falling under essential services. Now, the lockdown is being released in many countries, but the fact that we have to impose physical distancing will be a very critical challenge, which will be difficult to respect with the growing ridership in public transport. During the crisis, we have been pursuing two main priorities. First is to support the members, the public transport agencies and supplying industries. By sharing the knowledge, sharing experiences, we offer the number of webinars where our members could connect and share this experience. We organize the number of committee meetings covering different aspects of public transport operation, maintenance, institutional organization, relationship with the customers and how new technologies can support during this uh, crisis. We have been providing a daily support to our members. The second priority was to support the sector to advocate the benefits of public transport by issuing open letters to international organizations like the European Commission or the European Parliament. We have joined forces with partner associations covering other transport modes, other sectors, or from different regions of the world. We led a number of media talks to communicate about public transport and convey a positive image of the service. The long-term resiliency has to be approached considering the specificity of the COVID-19. We should not forget that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease that spread faster in polluted areas. So the work on climate change, the work on the environmental issues will serve as well the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. During the transition, the priority of public transport companies will be to manage the demand in order to avoid crowds in vehicles and stations. For that, they will need to increase the supply, to operate more trains and more buses, and to reduce the headway between the different services. Cleaning and disinfecting will continue and will be strengthened in order to restore trust and welcome back passengers in public transport systems. It's important also to communicate about these disinfection operations and to make it visible to the people and to the media. Government support is needed to compensate the loss in fare box revenues 
and to cover the additional cost of observing physical distancing and disinfecting and cleaning vehicles. Many measures could be considered, such as tax exemption, support for liquidity and bonds, and moratorium on debt reimbursement. The COVID-19 crisis should not make one lose sight of the persisting climate and ecological crisis. Building momentum to fight this battle has to stay high on the political agenda. The lessons learned from COVID-19 is that early action is essential, just like the fight against climate change. Therefore, we need to maintain ambition in order to continue cutting emissions and mitigate the risk. As the economy recovers, it should be steered toward a Green Deal compatible growth. We should resist the temptation of short-term solutions that encourage people to leap back into their cars. The use of public funds in the recovery will be immense, and now is the time to make the right political decisions. Without clear conditions for using those funds in favor of a model shift, we risk locking our cities in an unsustainable model of mobility for decades to come. We cannot afford to forget about the battles we have been fighting for so long. The mobility post-lockdown must be about moving people instead of moving cars. Thank you, Mohamed Mesgani from Brussels. So the future of public transport is of particular concern in countries which are still building up a public transport industry. Now we are listening to Royana Mosaji. She was in charge of the setup of the BRT system in Johannesburg, how South Africa is dealing, and in particular how the public transport in South Africa is dealing with the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Over to South Africa. Rihanna Musaji from the Barefoot Facilitator, the former member of the Mayoral Committee for Transport in the city of Johannesburg. So urban mobility in South Africa has been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, essentially, um, a range of urban mobility functions have been completely shut down during the lockdown period. So the rapid rail link, how train, uh, had been shut down for a number of weeks, as had the surface rail network, metro rail. Um, other public transport has continued to run uh, under very stringent conditions, reduction in the number of passengers uh, or commuters allowed on a minibus taxi, uh, on the Ria Via bus service, changes in the hours of operation. Uh, and as um, some of the systems have been brought back on stream, including um, the How Train, a rapid rail project, uh, very stringent requirements for all commuters to wear masks, for um, sanitization booths or sanitation booths been putting in to uh, entrances uh, to public transport interchanges um, and overall urban mobility particularly on the public transport side um, has has come in for a lot of difficulties uh, of course uh, our lockdown conditions in South Africa have been fairly stringent um, so even walking and cycling for exercise purposes have only been reintroduced more recently and even that under very limited hours and conditions. Uh, in many ways, the pandemic has seen a step back for those who are proponents of, of mass transit and non-motorized transport. So obviously not being fully involved in issues of transit and city government anymore, I speak from what I've been observing uh, on the media during the lockdown period. Um, the National Minister of Transport uh, together 
uh, with the executive mayor of the city of Johannesburg and the now member of the mayoral committee for transport had actually been on an inspection uh, to Riavaya in the last couple of days and had raised some concerns about um, the high patronage on the system, uh, which obviously given the social distancing requirements, uh, the minister felt that the system was not necessarily complying with the regulations that have been set out by government. This has been particularly interesting because South Africa is on a lockdown at the moment with only essential workers uh, with permits being allowed onto the transit system. And what that indicates is that all of the criticisms of the Riavaya bus rapid transit system in the past months and years around that the cost of the system is not justified based on the number of users, uh, yet during the pandemic, the concern is that there are too many people using the system, justifies the investment that the city of Johannesburg had made, not only in mass transit, but also in beginning to look at a more integrated transport system for the city. So what the COVID pandemic has done in relation to South African society is that it's highlighted a number of structural inequalities and issues that have been there pre-COVID. Uh, specifically, the issues around gender-based violence and violence against women in particular has unfortunately seen a rise and a spike in this period uh, and obviously with mobility hours being curtailed, uh, that has had a detrimental effect on women and their caregiving roles. Despite that, in this period of COVID-19, what we have seen in South Africa is people coming together across racial lines, across class lines, and across gender lines, and an outpouring of support around assistance and solidarity, particularly for the most vulnerable in society. And what we've learned is that community activism and local action uh, in, the, in a number of areas, community action networks or CANs have been set up uh, because really it is at the local level where people most understand each other's needs and requirements and the the, res the response at a local level coming together with uh, relief efforts that have been put in place, financial relief mechanisms from uh, national government through our unemployment insurance fund has seen some relief in a very difficult period. However, we are in comparison to the rest of the world in fairly early days um, at 60 days of lockdown in comparison to other countries and the overall impact, particularly uh, on the nature of an em employment, the nature of work, care of children, care of the elderly, the need to uh, prepare meals and, and feed people often fall on the shoulders of women disproportionately in the South African context. And what COVID has done is to indicate that the work of women does not necessarily get the recognition or the financial reward that it should get in relation to the well-being of society. Thank you, Rihanna, for these very important insights. Let's go forward. We now heard many experts explaining why it is so important to design economic stimuli packages in a way they also make sure we reach our climate targets. If we now waste money on industries which will be phased out later anyway, we will not see an economic recovery by therefore feel the climate crisis even more. After a few videos from our partners, we will hop to the American continent and still have our Women Mobilize Women panel. Please stay tuned.